Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this, the first Mr. Urban Futures annual lecture. Um, it's something that we have instituted this year, which is also the first year of our second phase of funding from Mr. and CEDA and the Gothenburg Consortium, and is intended both, in a sense, to help um, project the work we do and the ideas that we engage in um, across the two campuses, but also very much as part of our positioning uh, within the city and the region, given that the approach to work that Mr. Urban Futures follows uses co-production between academic and non-academic research partners. And inevitably, um, with such an event, there is some hard thinking to be done about who one might invite and who would, from the outside, project the sort of work and the sort of image that we would like to uh, publicize widely. But this year, it was actually extremely easy because um, Professor John Robinson, our inaugural annual lecturer, uh, first got to know us here last year as one of the independent international review panel members appointed to do our midterm review. And um, he was so well engaged and um, brought so much expertise, apart from having worked collaboratively here with Jan Holmberg and others for many years, that we invited him to join the newly constituted board of Mr. Urban Futures for phase two, and he was here for our conference the last couple of days, so we're taking advantage of his presence from Canada um, to, to give this lecture on a topic that is both very close to his heart, but centrally relevant to, to our multiple agendas. And in many ways, I guess, he needs very little introduction because uh, to people around the world, his reputation in terms of sustainability thinking and planning, particularly but not exclusively in relation to university campuses, um, has earned him in some quarters the, the sobriquet of Professor Sustainability. Until the end of last year, he had been at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and was responsible as adjunct provost for sustainability for creating one of the most sustainable uh, campuses there and with one of the most comprehensive sustainability programs of not just any Canadian university, but probably true worldwide. As I said a moment ago, he's been collaborating here at Sharma's with um, Jan Holmberg for a long time on living laboratories. He is also um, a consultant at the moment to the Copenhagen Business School for the sustainability aspects of their new campus um, that is in the design and moving slowly into um, development stage, and indeed is also playing a, a similar role with the, the business school here at, at the university. Um, his publications cover all aspects of that work, and I think it's important to, to mention that he thinks very profoundly and philosophically about the issues. It's not all applied and instrumental at all. Um, he's had numerous awards um, within Canada and internationally for that, but what his CV does not say in addition to all that is actually a jolly nice guy. So will you join me in welcoming Professor John Roberts as our inaugural annual lecturer. Thanks very much, David. Okay. Thank you, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. That's great. Um, I feel kind of at home in Sweden because I feel in a sort of a Canadian affinity for uh, the social democratic ethos of, of Scandinavia. I have a colleague, uh, Ted Parson, a Canadian in the US who says Canada is one third of the way across the Atlantic, culturally speaking. And I'd rather be two thirds, but I'm happy to be one third uh, uh, across. So it's always nice to come here. Um, and talk about sustainability and to try and do some sustainable things. And that's what I want to talk about today is the idea of universities really engaging with the world in a far more active way than is typically the case. 
We call it uh, Campus as Living Lab and University as Agent of Change. And I want to talk a little bit, it, it kind of started in my case with the SERS building in uh, 1999. It took us 11 years to get the building built. Um, and uh, so we learned a lot <laughs> along the way about how to try and institute deeply sustainable uh, infrastructure. That led to the ability to hit, uh, get involved at, at UBC on a campus-wide basis, and I spent about five years running sustainability, the integration of operational and academic sustainability across uh, the Vancouver campus of UBC. Uh, then, I, uh, as David said, I'm now at U of T uh, and trying to uh, promote some of those ideas there um, without any budget or mandate to do so. So it's kind of an interesting uh, role. And uh, I'm an adjunct prophet at Copenhagen Business School where uh, there are a lot of people who do a lot of things about sustainability uh, and there's an opportunity, we think, to uh, push this agenda. And then, so I'm going to say something about all of those, uh, and then at the very end, talk a little bit about Chalmers, because Chalmers is kind of an interesting example of many of the same things under John Holmberg's uh, leadership uh, and a bunch of other people. So I want to start with this question of what the social contract of universities is. What's our role in society? What are we supposed to be doing? Well, the old, and these are the kind of standard three things we all do, teaching and learning, research and service. Uh, the old model was pretty simple. We'll, we'll educate students and we'll do research and you give us money. That was the social contract. Um, and it lasted for a long time, but it's fallen apart now. I think it just doesn't work anymore. And the reason it doesn't work is it's not good enough um, uh, to just do those two things. There's a demand that universities do more than that. Not instead of, but in addition to. And if you look at the literature, about the social contract of universities, you see kind of three strands about the more that society is asking for. And the first one is about access and diversity. There's a whole literature and a whole uh, set of activities stretching back a long time about how universities can open themselves up more widely and allow a larger cross-section of people to engage. The second strand is uh, universities will make their regions more economically competitive. They'll contribute to academic growth. They will work with the private sector. Huge development along those lines that's given rise to, a, as you know, a big counter movement, this concern about uh, commercialization and sort of marketization of, of the university agenda. Um, uh, plus a whole cadre of social scientists who talk about neoliberalism, which nobody outside the university understands the meaning of. But nevertheless, it's part of the reaction to this. But I want to talk uh, about the third strand, um, which is the question of the universities actually engaging with the problems of society, not just to create economic growth, in fact, per perhaps not fundamentally to do that at all, or to do not to do that at all, but to address the problems faced by society. And I want to give an example of one such approach. And this is Arizona State. Arizona State University, as you may know, is a very large university, about 80,000 students. It's a state university, which in the US system uh, is, uh, tells you a whole bunch of things about the kind of university it is. Um, uh, and it exists within a fairly conservative political culture where, this, for example, the state government isn't allowed to use the words climate change in legislation, right? It's because that doesn't really exist. So, uh, you know, it's a particular context. And Michael Crow comes in as president of ASU, and he just bulldozed the whole place to the ground. Not the bricks and mortar, but all of the institutions, the edifices, the faculties. He tore them all apart and reconstituted them all. Uh, I don't know how. No university president I know has that kind of power, but he managed to do it. So it's an interesting case study in uh, uh, what, if it survives, I think could legitimately be called transformational institutional change. And what he says is we want to create the new American university. How American to use that adjective. Uh, but, uh, but let's just think of it as a new approach to universities. Um, uh, and what they call the reconceptualization of 21st century higher education. And this is their charter. And as you can see from that text, they're talking about access, which is a particularly interesting issue for them in the context of their uh, sort of the, the population they serve. Um, uh, 
and is also a particularly interesting issue in American universities in particular for a whole bunch of reasons we don't have to go into now. But they also have this other goal, which is uh, that the university should assume fundamental responsibility, not just responsibility, fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities it serves. Now think of your university and imagine that your university, whatever it is, is taking fundamental responsibility for the health of the community in which it exists. This is not typical university speak. This is not the way universities have seen their role. But how cool, right? I mean, this is really interesting. How would you even do this? Well, they have eight design aspirations. And I just want to walk through these. Leverage our place. This is a really interesting, actually, place to start. The place universities exist in is, uh, you know, spatially and culturally bound and all kinds of really interesting characteristics to it. So, for example, Arizona State, as I said, has a whole bunch of particular issues about diversity and culture that reflect where it sits. My university in Toronto is in a city where 51% of the population of the city of Toronto was born in another country, 51%. That's a really interesting fact that changes the whole nature of the city in, in really profound ways and creates a level of inter exchange and, and uh, indeed energy uh, that's pretty exciting. So university, pay attention to where you are. What you can do is a function of the particular circumstances of the, of the city and community you exist in. Enable student success. Of course, all universities say they enable student success. Almost all students are a little skeptical of that claim because it's more rhetoric than real. Um, the, the, uh, the, the things that are needed to be done to really enable student success aren't universally practiced by universities, I think. So taking that seriously um, would change things in many university cultures. Transform society. Universities are supposed to transform society. Fuse intellectual disciplines. Well, this one actually, I think, is uh, harder than all the others put together, uh, given the kind of uh, rigid uh, 19th century structure of universities, but more importantly, the way people identify with their discipline. That's not going to change anytime soon. So I think interdisciplinarity, especially deep interdisciplinarity, um, exists at the margins and in the interstices between the disciplinary silos, and that's, I don't think it's going to change uh, in the future, in the near future at least, and doesn't maybe need to. Uh, so that one may be a little strong, ironically enough. Value entrepreneurship, this raises the hackles of a lot of people, especially in the social sciences and humanities, who feel their university has been turned into a, uh, a, a, a sort of a boot camp for um, promoting industry activities. And yet, entrepreneurship itself, surely, is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Uh, and if the end is sustainability, maybe we can pretty easily see the need for a lot more entrepreneurship uh, than uh, is the case now. Be socially embedded. That connects back to number one. Um, uh, Use-inspired research. This is uh, interesting because it's low class, right? In universities, especially those that consider themselves towards the peak of the pyramid, uh, applied work is lower class. Uh, than, than theoretical work, and so, or, or curiosity-driven work, or whatever term you want to use. Uh, so this is challenging t to that view of the world, and engage globally. Um, very appropriate for a Mr. Urban Futures kind of uh, agenda. So again, imagine your university adopting these as the guiding principles. Imagine the reaction, actually, from large parts of the faculty uh, to that very idea. Um, Somehow at ASU, they at least claim to be doing this. I think there's mixed results in terms of action on the ground, but nevertheless, this is the, this is the goal. I kind of like those eight uh, design principles. So what I'm going to be talking about is in the spirit of, of these ideas. Uh, and I want to do that in the context of two cross-cutting approaches we've adopted that we find to be useful ways to organize thinking, but also activity on the ground. This is not just about theory. This is about practice in a fairly uh, deep and important way. Um, 
And the first is the idea of the campus as a living lab, a laboratory of sustainability, where every single operational decision the campus makes, literally every operational decision they make, is a sustainability decision. And therefore, let's take that seriously and use the campus to try stuff out. And I'll say a little more about that. And then, uh, since just having a whole bunch of sustainable campuses around the world doesn't really get us very far, uh, can the university be an agent of change, uh, working with partners, private, public, and civil society sector partners um, uh, to create the kind of transition to sustainability uh, that uh, we think is needed? So let me walk through those two ideas generally, and then I'll get down to the brass tacks of application. As I said, every operational decision the university makes, all the capital investment it does, all the building, design, and implementation and operations, the infrastructure development, food services, residences, but also the academic programming, these all have implications, sustainability implications. They can all be treated as opportunities to find better ways to do things uh, and then to uh, study and teach those ways. The key, as I'm gonna argue in a minute, is actually this. From an institutional culture change point of view, that's the key, but I'll, I'll come back to that. And then let's co-create solutions. Um, I'm very interested in the issue of co-production and maybe say a little bit more about it later, but the degree to which it is, it, it defaults simply to participation or consultation is a, an ever-present tendency in, the, in that world. The context, I think, for doing this, for treating the campus as a living laboratory, uh, the context I would propose is what we call regenerative sustainability goals. And I want to turn to that question of what we mean by sustainability. Because the dominant cultural discourse about sustainability has uh, um, two, I think, unfortunate characteristics. Um, it's been an argument that despite the origin of the term, if you think back to Lester Brown in 1981, building a sustainable society, the Brundtland Commission in 87, what were they doing? What was the argument there? Well, the argument was we've got to take environmental issues and integrate them with social and economic issues. And since then, the three-legged stool of those three has been turned sometimes into a five-legged uh, stool. Do we add culture? Do we add institutions? So on and so forth. But the general point was to get environment out of a, a little box out there and integrate it with uh, other concerns. And yet, if you take the average uh, you're to Borg citizen and ask them, the mythical average citizen, and ask them what sustainability means, if they've even heard the word, uh, my guess is you'd get the same answer you would get in Toronto or Vancouver, which is an environmental answer. So the word sustainability has come, has sort of defaulted back to the environmental, even though it was coined to broaden the discussion. Um, so that's one problem. Uh, the other problem is the way sustainability has been framed because of its historical and philosophical roots, which are really coming out of ecological science uh, and, and that whole uh, environmental science community, is framed in terms of limits and constraints. Think back to 1972, uh, limits to growth. Uh, think up the, the street a bit to Stockholm and the planetary boundaries hypothesis. This is the way the argument has been presented to people, which is basically that almost everything we do, and especially all the things we like to do, are bad. Uh, humanity is kind of a cancer on the planet. The best thing we could do for sustainability might be collective racial suicide. Uh, and so let's learn how to cut back, do without, do with less, and so on. That, that framing, I, as I say, you can trace that framing directly back to its source, and those sources are really powerful arguments that can, shouldn't be ignored. Nevertheless, it turns out that uh, uh, sustainability as sacrifice isn't utterly uh, compelling, behaviorally speaking. People don't jump on the bandwagon of cutting back and leap to the front of the social movement of sacrifice for future generations. It's not very motivating. 
Secondly, it's as I, or sorry, so that's the second problem. The first problem is the environmental one, uh, being too much limited to an environmental position. The second is not very motivating. There's a couple of others as well, um, including being too scientific and too mechanical, but l just those two alone that I've mentioned, I think are enough to suggest that maybe we need to reframe the sustainability narrative a bit and escape from this kind of uh, a story of a sacrifice and doing without. That's what we call regenerative sustainability. Is it possible that we could actually look for forms of human activity that don't, aren't just less bad? It's not about harm reduction and damage limitation, but they're actually more good. They create positive outcomes, not just reduce negative outcomes. Can we move, therefore, from reducing damage to uh, creating benefit, from sacrifice to contribution, or to use the language of the building industry, from net zero to net positive? I mean, net zero buildings, how exciting. Here's a building that's zero, you know? That's really uh, a powerful motivator. Um, uh, net positive, that's a different story. What does that mean? I think what it means is that we're looking for forms of human activity that don't have to be minimized because they're so damaging, but forms of human activity that actually simultaneously increase human and environmental well-being. Now think of that just for a second. Two crucial shifts in the narrative there. First of all, simultaneously. It's not that we're doing the human stuff because of the environmental stuff. Uh, the, the environment rules and, you know, people have to follow along and accord to the, you know, the, the uh, thermodynamic limitations of the planet. It's that both are independently valuable. We want both. These are ends. We want environmental well-being to increase and we want human well-being to increase. Um, and se the second characteristic is, of course, that it's both. It's not just um, uh, environment uh, and it's not just social justice. There's my little hidden, uh, not so hidden concern about just cities as a way of framing the problem. Um, it's about both. So it's positive and it's about both. Those are the crucial characteristics of this. Now, let me, however, qualify this immediately by saying not everything can be regenerative. Uh, there are lots of things that just need to be mitigated. There's lots of damage that just needs to be reduced. No question about that. The argument here isn't that everything becomes win-win, uh, Pollyanna uh, skipping merrily down the path. It's that uh, we look there first. We look for regenerative sustainability before we uh, default to harm reduction and damage limitation. And the interesting question then becomes, where can we do this? What processes? At what scales? Could we have regenerative buildings? Well, we actually built one. We think we can build, in fact, it's fairly simple, I think, to do. Uh, well, it's complicated. It's not complex from a technical point of view, um, uh, although it's politically complex, so maybe that's enough. Uh, buildings, how about transportation systems? Could we have a regenerative transportation system? Industrial processes, a regenerative industrial process? Cities. Could we have a city that by its normal operating procedures, just the way it naturally unfolds, improves human well-being and environmental well-being at the same time? Now, surely to God, that's a city we would all want to live in if it's, a, if it's possible. So isn't this a useful question to ask? And since it hasn't been much asked, because we've been so focused on harm reduction, this is a role the university can play. Who asks these kind of questions? That's us, right? So this is something the university can really contribute to, looking for opportunities for regenerative sustainability, recognizing they're not just lying around to be picked up and adopted, uh, that they're gonna involve hard work, both conceptual and practical. Okay, so with that as a, as a sort of a guidepost, I wanna say a few words about why universities can do living labs in ways that nobody else can do living labs. And that's because we have these four characteristics that no other institution in society combines. We're a single owner occupier of significant capital stock at a very cool scale. It's urban neighborhood scale. UBC is 400 hectares and 400 buildings. Take 400 buildings, um, uh, uh, downtown Vancouver, you've got thousands of owners. UBC has one owner. So, I put owner, however, in parentheses there because a lot of other universities in other parts of the world don't own their capital stock, but they are the managers of it. They're uh, single occupiers. 
we live in what we build because uh, we are going to use it. We're not developers building things and selling them off. We actually live in what we build. So we have an inherent life cycle interest in our capital stock although you'd be hard-pressed to see the effects of that in the actual decisions that get made because of the usual separation of operations and capital. You know, that's in many ways the biggest single barrier to sustainability that exists is this separation of operational and, ca and, and capital uh, decision-making. But that's a whole other story. So we're single owner occupiers, we can act. Um, we're public institutions. What does that mean? That meant at UBC we would take a 15-year payback on capital investment that had academic purpose, because that's our goal, academic purpose. And also because faculty could care less about what's cost-effective, they just want what they want. Um, so uh, give me a private sector organization that will accept a 15-year payback. Some social enterprises, tiny examples, it's hard to do. We can do stuff the market won't do and can't do. That's number two. Number three, we teach, and number four, we do research. Nobody else has that mixture. So we can create the sandbox, treat the whole campus as an opportunity. Everything we do there is of interest from a sustainability point of view. Everything we do there is pretty bad, pretty much, and could be quite significantly improved. And as we improve it, we can study it, and we can publish about that. As we improve it, we can teach and then people leave with skills they can apply in their job. By the way, the concept of green jobs, as a small parenthesis, is a terrible concept. Don't ever accept anyone talking about green jobs. There isn't a job in the universe that doesn't have sustainability dimensions to it. Every job has some sustainability dimensions. And so every student can use sustainability at some level for some purpose. Okay, so that's the kind of idea and then, if we want to get out into the community, it's about what we call strategic partnerships. This isn't going to industry and say, give us money uh, through philanthropy or give us a discount when we buy your equipment, the two main ways the private sector engages financially with uh, the university. Um, this is going to say, where do you have an agenda that, if combined with ours, allows both of us to do our job better um, in all three sectors uh, and work together to contribute to solutions. It's crucial to focus on student engagement. This is something faculty have to learn. Uh, it's very boring to work with faculty for anybody outside the university, it's like it, and it's just a, often a nightmare. Students, everybody loves students. So it, it, stuff has to be student-led. Students have to be at the forefront. It's about engaging students with society way more than it's about engaging faculty with society because we as faculty actually don't care much about society. Our promotion and tenure depends on our peers in other institutions. And so uh, that's not to say faculty don't engage and that, that doesn't happen. But I, I just know from a lot of experience that making students central to this really enhances the ability to work with partners. And then co-production, of course, I don't have to say much about co-production to this audience, um, uh, but it's crucial. And the, the great thing about Mr. Urban Futures, I believe one of the great things has been a serious attempt to grapple with what co-production means. This term is now being adopted by all kinds of agencies all over the place, usually with very little understanding of what it means. Um, and so a ton of lip service, everybody's talking about doing co-production, they usually mean by that or often mean by that, oh, we're engaging somehow with partners. But, you know, that's not quite true co-production, let alone co-creation. Do the partners get to choose the research questions? That's always a good question to ask. Um, okay, I want to say just a word about institutional culture change, because what prevents all this stuff from happening that I'm talking about? Well, one of the biggest barriers is institutional culture change within the university itself which an institutional culture change, in fact, culture change generally, is a slow variable, right? It's not fast. Technology is often fast. Behavior is often a fast variable. But cult institutional culture, that's a slow variable. So we have to recognize that in processes of subverting the university, uh, that, that this has to go on and it's going to take time. And the, the big cultural problem in universities is this divide between the academic side of the house, faculty and students, and the operational side, all the staff that are actually keeping the system going. Um, and it's uh, an invidious class system in most universities. 
um, it's pretty clear which box is above which box. Um, I call it the problem of the pyramid and the plane. So what we have here, here, down on the operational side is the pyramid, right? Because people actually have jobs with job descriptions and bosses and accountability. So they report up. You know, it, if the president of the university says something, they actually pay attention to it. Well, we know what happens on the academic side. Um, a slightly different response. So that's the, that's the pyramid. And then we have the infinite plane of the faculty. And the infinite plane of the faculty, I've, I've never met a faculty member who thinks they work for the university. We don't work for the university. The university is there to give me an office and, you know, salary comes in handy, but I'm an independent, uh, you know, uh, l like legislatively independent mind. My peers are in other universities around the world. Uh, uh, they're not here. Nothing that happens on this campus actually has a huge effect on my career, except maybe a few people in my department that are involved in promotion and tenure processes. And then I have to do some teaching that my chair might impose. But generally speaking, uh, I, I, my gaze is out there. And so I'm part of that infinite plane of the faculty. Maybe it's different here in Sweden. You know, maybe people actually, academics actually feel that they work for the university. I doubt it, but I could be wrong. How do we create processes where we actually integrate? This is the fundamental institutional change required to make universities act differently. Every university in the world pretty much is doing teaching and research on sustainability. Every university in the world is also doing operational sustainability, bioenergy here or, or uh, water conservation there, whatever it might be, energy efficiency in buildings. The two worlds never connect. Faculty don't have the faintest clue how the university operates. They just don't. Um, and uh, so there's no interaction. Creating a culture where these two actually speak to each other deeply liberates the institution. It changes the whole discussion about what sustainability means for the university. This is not about a subject area. This isn't about saying, hmm, should we spend this year promoting physics or sustainability? That's not the question. Sustainability becomes something that runs through the whole fabric of the university in a way that no subject area can. Um, and it becomes part of the identity of the institution itself. And I can testify, I've watched this happen uh, over 22 years at UBC uh, and the profound changes it leads to. I'll give you one example. The operational side gets liberated because instead of them being just the people keeping the lights on, now they're part of the academic agenda, which is, of course, heartland for the university in the end. It's an academic agenda. So I had an operational management group at UBC that was the head of campus planning, the head of infrastructure development, the head of building operations, the head of energy and water services, the head of student hospitality and housing, which was residences and food services, the head of payment and purchasing. Every one of them was a sustainability champion, and we would meet just to plot how to engage students in their operations. And they were telling their staff, this is uh, what we're about. That changes the game and it opens the door to applications for students that are not otherwise available. So that's the culture change we need. Now let me walk you through some of the stuff we did at UBC. That's the UBC campus. I just get your hands around that, right? Like what a cool scale that is to try and create a change at the urban neighborhood scale. That's the same picture, it's just a different view. This is underground. This is the district energy system that underlies uh, the UBC campus, 14 kilometers of pipeline. And here's the climate change goals that came out of part of this kind of process um, in 2010. So six years, uh, almost six and a half years ago now. By that time, UBC had reached Kyoto. In other words, the number of students from 1990 to 2007 had gone up 50%. The floor space had gone up 35%. Emissions had dropped 6% in absolute terms, none of these intensity targets. So, so the cream was skimmed, in a sense. The easy stuff had already been done. So starting from that base, lower than 1990, the target was 33% by 2015, last year, 67 by 2020, 100 by 2050. Um, didn't make the 33, but it's happening this year. So one year late, uh, a 33% reduction. That's 20,000 tons, by the way. 
Um, okay, so that's board approved official targets. Here's what I think the target should be. So this is not official UBC policy. Uh, the first one is still there. That's the official one. Eliminate fossils entirely from the campus. That is part of the official plan. But the interesting one is let's not build any new electricity transmission lines. Uh, those lines go through the most expensive real estate in British Columbia. Uh, not happy uh, times for the utility, for the university, and certainly not for the residents to build a hundred million dollar new transmission line through that expensive real estate. So everybody has an incentive to avoid that. But think about that. Eliminate fossils and don't increase electricity transmission and grow 35% in physical floor space. Now imagine if that were happened. What is the lesson here? Just think how powerful the lesson is. People would be beating a path to the door to find out how this could be done. And if we're documenting it, we're studying it, we're improving it over time, and we're teaching it, it becomes uh, a really important story. There is a plan, there's a roadmap. These, all these things on the left in 2015 have already been done. Um, and then there's a plan for 2020, and then there's italicized text for 2050, <laughs> right? We gotta recognize uncertainty here. The 2050 plans are not gonna be anything like this. We know that. But we have some of the things we have to start thinking about now because of lead times. Here's the projects that got to the 33% by 2015, well, by this year. Four projects. A 72 building continuous optimization program. Continuous optimization is really interesting because what we do is we build buildings uh, and then five years later we say, well, I wonder how that's doing. And we go in and do a, a little post-occupancy thing or measurement and verification thing. We discover it's kind of a disaster and so we optimize it a bit and then we wait five more years and find out that that didn't work very well. So continuous optimization is the idea that we actually should pay attention continuously. It's never continuous. At the best we get to is less discontinuous, but that's, that's an improvement. And this 72 building uh, uh, program is gonna save about 10 to 12% of the carbon emissions of the campus. Tons of interesting research issues, by the way, uh, on that. Uh, Center for Interactive Research, that's the building I mentioned, I'll say more about that later. Here's the biggie, $90 million to convert the steam system, district energy system with steam for reasons that no, you know, no one can understand. Why would you have steam as your carrier when it, you're trying to heat buildings mostly? Um, uh, there's sort of a thermodynamic problem there. Uh, uh, so converting it to hot water uh, reduce, greatly increases efficiency. The condensate return problem goes away. It's lower temperature, so it's more efficient. Uh, and it's way more friendly to renewables. So that's a kind of backbone technology, an enabling technology that saves a ton of carbon on its own, but actually also enables other developments. Uh, and then the final one was to build a bioenergy plant. Uh, a really interesting story. All the original goals failed in the bioenergy plant, but it's actually doing better now than the original goals had. So they've changed it all around, which couldn't have happened if it wasn't seen as a living lab kind of project. Right? That, that's, the, that's the key change here. Everything is something now open to revision and change and learning um, uh, because it's conceived in that way. Now notice this bottom line. The Board of Governors of UBC approved $150 million of capital investment to reach our 2015 climate goals. Look at your university and ask them, what's your capital investment in sustainability or climate change? And see how many orders of magnitude lower it is than this. Chalmers may actually be quite high. I don't know what the number is, but not too many universities are doing this. And if you want to know how this happens, I can send you a speech by the VP Finance who came up in front of our workshop and said, I'm Darth Vader, you know, I'm, uh, I'm the CFO. Uh, why would I do uh, $150 million of sustainability? And his speech gives his reasons. It's kind of an interesting story. He was our, one of our biggest champions. Um, okay, how, what's all this led to and outcomes? Uh, well, don't worry too much about this, but total emissions have dropped 22% from 2007. So remember, it's supposed to be 33, so a ways to go. Um, student enrollment up 18% while these emissions are dropping. Floor space up 11%. 
absolute reduction with increase in activity? This is, a, this is the kind of decoupling question that, or dematerialization kind of question, decarbonization. Uh, uh, there are things that can be done. There's limits, but there are things. I want to just say a word about SIRS because I can't help it. I have to say something about SIRS because um, uh, it was my whole life for so long. But basically, uh, we wanted to build a building, don't worry about all the systems, that was net positive in both environmental and human terms. So the goals were to be net positive in energy, operational carbon, structural carbon, and water quality. What, th what does that mean? That means adding a 60,000 or a 6,000 square meter building to the UBC campus would reduce campus energy use, not the building's energy use. The campus would use less energy by adding a building and therefore emit less carbon by adding a building. And then the building would sequester more carbon because it's a wood structured building um, uh, than all the carbon emitted by all the construction machinery building the building and all the carbon emitted manufacturing everything in the building. That's net positive in structural carbon. You don't hear as much about structural carbon. It's huge. We've got to sequester a lot of carbon this century, a ton. Cities should be seeing themselves as carbon sequestration engines. Sweden, like Canada, should be building a lot more wood for carbon sequestration purposes. I mean, we are countries with big forestry industries. We have a, a pretty strong responsibility to address carbon sequestration. Uh, and then water. Four billion liters of rain falls on the UBC campus every year, and uh, we use four billion liters of water, none of which comes from the rain, until this building was built. So the idea is, let's have a building that is 100% dependent on rainwater, instead of water from the city, which, by the way, comes in a single pipe system all over the world, uh, which means it's all treated to potable, even though like 10% is ever drunk. So over the whole planet, we're massively over-treating water in order to, because they're single pipe delivery systems and you've got to have potable for this small percentage of use. It's, it's kind of insane and yet that's what we're doing. So we said we don't want to get water from the city, we want to get it all from the uh, sky and if there's anywhere on the planet, surely we could do rainwater harvesting, it's Vancouver, um, and have seasonal storage, 100,000 liter uh, tank uh, below the building um, and then you have to treat it because potable water isn't drinkable. Uh, so you treat it, you collect it, you treat it, you drink it, you flush it, you treat it, and you irrigate. And so the water leaving the building is cleaner than the rain. That's net positive in water quality. Um, uh, and because, oh well, there's more to the story. But I won't go through all of that. So those are the four net positive environmental outcomes. They aren't working properly yet, most of them. Um, the structural carbon one, of course, is because it's the structure of the building. But that's the point of a living lab. These systems, if they had been put in a, a building in the market, they would have been turned off years ago. The building opened in 2011. But because it's a living lab, because we're trying to fix it and teach it, we're going to fix it and make it work. That's something university can do that won't happen in the marketplace. Um, but it's not just about, remember, environmental well-being, it's also about human well-being. Could we build a building that makes people healthier, more productive, and happier? That's the goal. The explicit goal of this building is to make people healthier, happier, and more productive. And we have quite a lot of work going on on that question. What does that mean? And I have a big, long story. I don't have time to tell you about that. But the, you know what's happening? It's sort of interesting. This is working better than this. The human side is carrying the environmental. This is a lesson the building industry needs to learn. If you talk about sustainable buildings, people are thinking green buildings. They're thinking environment. Uh, and uh, it's the human side that's going to lead the way. If we can do this on the right, it carries the environmental stuff with it because air quality, natural light, uh, wood, all these things have deep environmental consequences. So we've, we've got it backwards. We started talking about sustainable buildings as if the environmental side was the crucial piece. I think you start with the human well-being and then bring the environment along. That's going to be way more interesting to designers who are trained in human values, not environmental values, and way more interesting to clients because the energy costs per square meter of a building is about 1% of the labor cost in an office building. 1%. Tiny improvement in productivity swamps the energy savings. Uh, so the opportunity, this is where we need to focus, because we're way better at this. 
we don't have the metrics, we don't have the tools uh, on the social sustainability side. Okay, then treat the whole thing. Everything is a, is a, is a, is a research program. The walls, the paint, the cladding, the, the furniture, the energy, it's all research on how to make a building more sustainable. Okay, uh, quickly, infrastructure policies, there's a bunch of them. I'm not going to go through all this except to note that there's a lot of stuff, a lot of work involved in creating all of these kind of changes, but notice the bottom line there. What's the official aspiration for uh, the uh, infrastructure development and campus planning and building operations and energy and water? Regenerative buildings. That changes things when they're that's part of the thinking from the design stage, not as some kind of afterthought. Oh, well, let's add a little sustainability. You know, yeah. it's depressing how often that happens. Wood. I mentioned wood before. Big technological change. The highest you could build a wood building for many years was four stories for health and safety reasons. Cross laminated timber. Remember that acronym, CLT. You can now go up. UBC is building the tallest wood building in the world, or at least it was the tallest as of the time of the design of this building, 18 stories as a student residence. How cool is that? Students are going to be living in a building that is sequestering carbon and represents a technological breakthrough in sustainability of buildings. And they're going to see that wood because that's a crucial part of it. Then take some old buildings full of asbestos and other horrible things and strip them and turn them into a living lab. Monitor them, censor them to the gills, and then study behavior. So, uh, behavioral sustainability, huge research area, especially if you escape from all the behavioral economists and psychologists who think it's all about co individual cognitive change and you start thinking about social practice. Uh, and uh, normalizing sustainability, but that's my bias. Either end of the spectrum is interesting, and there's lots of work to do. Supply chain management. This was sent to me by the guy who's the head of payment and purchasing, and he was so proud because UBC got on the cover of his, the journal, his trade journal that he reads. Uh, not an academic publication, of course, um, but nevertheless, he was very proud that his supply chain management policies were actually worthy of, you know, uh, some attention by the outside world. Universities are big purchasers. Lots of things we can do there. Then you have to get down into the guts. You know, policy is great, getting good policy change, and so much social science is focused on policy, but it just doesn't get you there. You can have great policies and crappy practices, and you have to get down into the institutional guts. It's about the job descriptions, the performance evaluation criteria, the codes of practice, the, the, the um, professional standards, the regulatory requirements. That's what determines what people do on Monday morning, not the policy. So you, that policy has to be translated into a deep level of, uh, you know, the overall plan, sure. Then we get down to the community plan, resource plans, but it's down here on the bottom left, the technical and design guidelines and so on. And then let's start to articulate these in terms of different, uh, different um, dimensions. I love this slide because when UBC created a new division of energy and water services, this was a paragraph from the job description that was posted campus as a living lab in the job description. The person hired here knows their job is to do campus as a living lab. You know, that's different than they get hired and then someone comes and knocks on their door and says, hey, please do campus as a living lab. This is starting to become institutionalized. It's not just about buildings and technology and engineering. What about the social sustainability side at UBC? Well, as I said, we define social sustainability in terms of human well-being. Nobody understands what social sustainability means. They, well, sustainability has too many syllables, but social sustainability is just, you know, who knows. Human well-being, on the other hand, people kind of get. Uh, it, it's a much easier concept to communicate. So 
an office was set up, the UBC Wellbeing Initiative, and these were all the issues that came to the fore. Access and diversity, intercultural understanding, First Nations, sport. Sport is really interesting. I bet if you went outside on Saturday afternoon or most evenings in Gothenburg to all the soccer fields, what do you see? Tons and tons of parents and volunteer coaches and tons and tons of kids and a whole bunch of social capital building. Sport is a really interesting entry point into sustainability. Um, okay, and on and on. And they've turned that into some priorities. Number one, mental health. We have a mental health epidemic in Canadian universities. I don't know what the Swedish equivalent is, but it's a really serious problem in universities. It's actually, universities are the canary in the mine. It's out there. Uh, but universities are institutionalized to recognize it for obvious reasons. So that's number one, and then there's a bunch of others. Okay, sustainability is often behind the wall. It's often invisible. You don't see it. So uh, making it visible is important. Let's start creating ways of marking and branding and signaling sustainability so that everybody sees this. This can be bad if you're not actually doing anything other than this. Then it's just kind of a greenwashing uh, process. Uh, but if you are doing the other things, then this helps because this is starting to bring it to the surface and you can have other kinds of discussion. Okay, that's Living Lab. How about Agent of Change? Well, this is what the president of UBC said uh, in New York in 2007. Uh, let's figure out. It's, a, it's actually pretty interesting from a... Uh, Mr. Urban Futures point of view, this was 2007, so at about the similar time um, uh, that uh, he was saying this. I want to just mention one partnership that with the City of Vancouver, which is very powerful because they have their own very big ambitions. They want to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. That was what the mayor said uh, we have to have happen. Um, I wasn't a big fan of that, actually, wording of that, but that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a process uh, moving in a direction, a positive direction. But obviously, we had some shared goals. So we created a program we call Greenest City Scholars. We gave the, the city 10 students uh, for uh, a year for six-week, 250-hour uh, internships. But the key was the city came up with the projects. They, they put a call across the whole city government, they took in proposals, they vetted them, and they came, back with, they came to us with 10. These were all things that were on the to-do list, but they were going to fall off. The bandwidth wasn't sufficient. So there were things that units in the city wanted to get done, but they didn't think they'd be able to get done. But 250 hours of a student would enable to get done. Uh, so they came to us with the projects. We put out a call across the whole university, and we interviewed and vetted the students and matched them to the actual job. We could never have come up with the projects. We don't know what the city needs done. They could never find the students because they don't know how, to, nobody knows how to get into the university from outside anyway. It's completely opaque and impenetrable. So that it was a really nice combination. This is one generation. This After four years, this, there'd been four, four times 10, 40 students. They'd hired eight of them. Wasn't part of the plan, but it just happened and evolved for reasons that are obvious in retrospect. Um, so they came back to us and said, we want 20 this year. We got so much demand from our units across the city. We need 20. We said, we've only got 50K. We can only afford 10. They said, no, no, we'll pay. Ah, the light went off. If they'll pay, maybe others will pay. BC Hydro took six that year. Fortis, the gas company, took one that year. So we saw the opportunity to turn this into a program that didn't require continuous subsidy on our side. If it was of value to the partner, we needed those four years of experience to show real value. And this is Sean Pander uh, from the Sustainability Office. And I can tell you, we've had almost no program that was more uh, successful than this. And so instead of 10 a year, it's been growing. In 2015, it was f over 50, and we see continuous improvement uh, possible. So that's the Scholars Program. But let's go beyond that. Let's think, okay, Scholars, uh, it was 39 in the year this slide was done. There's also an internal sustainability program called SEEDS, which puts students to work on sustainability problems of the university working with operational staff. So it's sort of like the internship program, but with on-campus operational staff and for credit instead of for money. Um, and 800 students a year do that at UBC. 
And then we have the Center for Community Engaged Learning there that puts 3,900 students a year out in the community working mostly with NGOs. So why don't we combine all this, what we call the nexus, and say, okay, our goal is 1,000 students a year doing on-campus sustainability projects uh, with operational staff and four or 5,000 a year in the community doing sustainability projects with partners. We're almost there before we start in terms of what's already going on. And think how powerful that is if your university is putting 6,000 students a year on real-world applied projects both on campus and off. I want to say something about curriculum because this is a crucial piece of the puzzle. Uh, our idea was, as I said, let's not create new programs and new little clusters of students because uh, those programs will only ever be taken by a small minority of the campus. We want to reach every single student on campus. So let's create pathways so that every student at UBC will be offered a pathway that will add sustainability to their program no matter what program they're in. Whether they're in civil engineering or medieval history, doesn't matter, you'll be offered a sustainability pathway on the view that no matter what job you have, there will be some value to that knowledge to you. Um, so let's do that uh, instead of creating uh, new programs. Here's the concept, pretty simple. Uh, uh, I'll s uh, the idea was not create new first year courses because that's hugely time consuming and gets into other political problems. So we went to all the big first year courses and said, would you add sustainability to your content? They all said yes. I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, th that means you're reaching the first year students. You build in, second year is where you choose a major in, in our university system. So you build in some introductory work. You have a bunch of electives and then you do the community engaged learning stuff and some leadership capstone stuff. That's, that has, that's new usually, and that's at the faculty level. Um, and meanwhile, it's cohort-based, so you're creating a community of students who work through the system together. Uh, so that's the concept. In terms of implementation, as I said, we went to psychology, geography, biology, chemistry, math, applied science, sociology, and business. Um, is, yeah, engineering's up there. Um, and we said, would you add sustainability? They all said yes. Math said, well, we know the principles we want to teach. Give us examples. Well, how, how easy is that? Sustainability examples to illustrate first-year math principles? I mean, that's not really hard. They couldn't do it. They're not sustainability people. We could do that. Very little effort. And we I I inject content. Every student at UBC takes at least one, and usually more than one, of the, these introductory courses. So by going to seven courses, you have reached every incoming student once you've implemented this. That's a, that's a game changer. Then you work with, uh, with departments about electives and community service learning, but you need an inventory. So we did an inventory and found that 450 courses already had sustainability content. They're already out there. The champions are already out there teaching this stuff, often isolated and feeling alone because they're not part of a, a sense of a common purpose in a community. So create that community and then work at the faculty level on leadership courses. It's not hard. Like this is not rocket science to do this stuff. It just needs some concentrated effort. Now, what's common? If we have students in civil engineering and medieval history, as I said, both doing a sustainability pathway, what, what, what's common to them? Very different programs. We think these four things are common. Some kind of integrated systems thinking has to be there. Some kind of content knowledge that's particular to the field, of course, has to be there. Interdisciplinarity is crucial. And finally, a problem orientation. It's about real world problem solving. Th that can be common to all of them. So it's not hard to turn it in those into learning outcomes. And this is on the website for students to say, you know, create your, your sustainability pathway. I just want to say one thing, that the student groups are crucial. We couldn't have done any of this without the political support of the student groups at the university. That's a really powerful constituency. I'll give you one example. AMS Sustainability, the Undergraduate Student Society, spends $100,000 a year uh, in grants to students to do sustainability projects. They give out $100,000 a year. They tax the student body, and the student body agreed in referendum for this to happen uh, so that they can hand out this money. Uh, okay, that's UBC, quick and dirty overview. 
How about Copenhagen Business School? Well, the difference with Copenhagen Business School is, of course, it's a business school. There's no engineering there. There's no natural science there. Lots of social science. Um, so maybe it can take an approach to the living lab and agent of change, which is about the role of business. We're not going to get a sustainability transition if the private sector isn't subverted entirely into this agenda in one way or another. It, it, they're the biggest agent of change on the planet, and so they have to be uh, incorporated into the process of creating sustainability, one way or the other. Uh, so the two ideas, again, let's apply them to Copenhagen Business School. And uh, there's a campus redevelopment project going, and then there's a lot of exchange with the community that offer this opportunity. There's the campus. This is actually a picture of the new campus they want to build. So here's a new building, here's a new building, here's a new building, here's a new addendum to a building. This is the campus right here. Very small, in the middle of Freiksberg, which is completely surrounded by Copenhagen. It's sort of one of these weird municipalities um, uh, that is, exists in that kind of form. Uh, so could this be a living lab? Uh, the funding is not available for this yet, as, as David uh, mentioned, so it may not happen. But if it does happen, uh, it's a big project. And uh, the theme is entrepreneurship and innovation. But entrepreneurship and innovation are means. They're not ends. You don't do entrepreneurship just so you do entrepreneurship. You do it in order to create something. What's the end? The end is, could be sustainability. Um, blah, blah, blah. Campus as Living Lab. What we're trying to do is develop a behavioral sustainability research program. We have a, actually a behavioral economics group in CBS that are very interested in waste behavior, uh, which is a beautiful test case. I have a student at UBC doing her PhD on sustainability waste behavior. They're doing 19 interventions across the campus and trying out different things. So they, they're interested in that. Uh, and then the question of the business dimension of sustainability innovations. As we switch from, uh, to some degree from commodities to services, what are the revenue models and the business plans that actually make sense if you're trying to sell services instead of sell commodities, like you're trying to sell mobility instead of sell uh, passenger kilometers, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's the sort of research agenda. Uh, my colleague Christian Jesperson is teaching a new course uh, on uh, business implications and opportunities connected to campus operational sustainability projects. Um, and then in the agent of change side, uh, what's the role of Scandinavian business in the sustainability transition? The s business sector here um, is uh, at least mildly more progressive than the business sector in many parts of the world on sustainability. So can that business sector see itself as part of an agent of change in the larger global transition? And what would that look like? What kind of arguments could be made for that? These are the partners that have uh, jumped enthusiastically on board this kind of process. And I can tell you, uh, UBC, CBS, uh, I'm finding now in Toronto, there's just a ton of partners that are interested in working if it's real partnership. It's not exploitive and extractive in the usual way academics work with the world. So again, Mr. Urban Futures. Uh, we have four projects we're trying to implement, student engagement, an industrial PhD program, uh, community engagement activities, and a sustainability growth fund for that gap, you know, the chasm, the famous chasm between early startup and commercialization uh, to scale. Uh, so I won't go through those, but they're, they're all bubbling along at some level or another. I want to end this part by talking about a really cool student-led initiative. On the right there, this is the old police station in uh, Freiksberg, and uh, CBS bought it and gave it to a bunch of students who want to build Student Innovation House. And the students went out and raised 52.5 million kroner. Okay, so 10 million Canadian dollars. I can't tell you. Well, Swedish, it would be more than 50, right? It's, uh, so they raised that uh, themselves for the renovation. Now, CBS is saying you've got to raise another 25, so that, that process is ongoing. But that's student-led. That's They brought the money in, so they get some control over the process. And this is what they want to do. This is what they started out saying. Foster students who are creative, engaging, collaborative. That's the steering committee, by the way, on the top right there, et cetera. This is what they want their house to be. We went to them and said, 
okay, you're going to spend 50 to 75 million on the retrofit. Turn it into a living lab. Monitor it. Study the process because the kind of entrepreneurship you're talking about can be reflected in partnerships about the retrofit itself. Um, and uh, so that's what's happening now. That's kind of cool. Uh, finally, well, the penultimately, University of Toronto, an urban campus, right? Right in the middle of Toronto. Uh, because there, the university is not acting sort of corporately about sustainability, and I don't think it will, it's just the way it's structured, it's impossible, I think. Um, we're trying to do what we call a groundswell. So just create a whole ton of sustainability stuff all over the place, and then they'll want to own it. Once it's there and visible and successful, then of course they want to take credit for it. So let's do it anyway, without mandate, without budget, and just make it happen. That's the experiment from a social science point of view about institutional change. Here are the nine projects I'm trying to get started. Um, uh, and the idea is build living lab, agent of change, strong partnerships, regenerative sustainability, and participatory community engagement into all of these. The first six are infrastructure projects. They're buildings and infrastructure. Uh, I won't go through them, but there are all kinds of cool opportunities. Like, shouldn't we build, we're building this big new residence, student residence right on the edge of campus. Should be the most sustainable residence in the planet, right? That should be the design goals built into the design brief, and on and on. Um, I just want to make a point. Uh, UB, U of T is going through a se campus secondary plan. No, not one single student or faculty member I've talked to knows this. Like, the university is going through this huge planning exercise. No one in the community actually knows it's happening. It's so typical. It's just exactly how it always happens. So uh, this is the plan. Uh, and what we want to do is create these projects uh, that incorporate broad sustainability framing, deeply participatory community engagement process. At Copenhagen Business School, we had 33 me meetings in a month and a half with faculty, staff, and students. Nobody had ever done that. Like, this, again, it's not rocket science. It's not like hard to have a meeting, but you have to consciously decide to. Um, and then Living Lab. So look at this. this is, I think this is very cool. One Spadina, the new home of architecture. Sid Smith, the home of the Faculty of Arts and Science. The new residence I mentioned a minute ago. Trinity College, my old college, which is already really keen about a lot of this stuff. Uh, Kings, oh, don't even get started on that. And then get engineering students to do a whole... Uh, completely class-based deep retrofit analysis of all 120 buildings on campus. If we could get a few of these things going, we're starting to get some real coverage. We're starting to get some real presence on the campus. So those are the, the infrastructure ones. Then there's student engagement pathways. I've talked about pathways, so I won't go into that. But student engagement, we see two routes, for money and for credit. And I've already mentioned both of those. They're both powerful ways. Um, sometimes student need, uh, students need money to support their educational process. Um, and so the internship route might work really well. Other times, credit works for them, both on campus and off. I'm teaching two courses uh, at U of T, two new courses this year. One is working with the City of Toronto on the new climate plan. So I had four students doing 100% uh, uh, um, uh, renewable energy city, four on electric vehicle charging stations, two on green infrastructure, whatever the city comes up with as projects they would like some work done on. And now uh, the course I'm teaching right now, I'm actually missing week two because I'm here, uh, is working with operational staff on putting students in projects there. So trying to model the kind of concept. Okay, let me end with Chalmers. Here we are. Already doing some cool stuff on the t curriculum front. Doing this amazing areas of advanced thing. This is incredibly interesting because this matrix structure where you have these cross-cutting interdisciplinary things and attach money and reward to them, that's the key, changes the culture. Although uh, I'm on good authority told, could be better, yeah, could be stronger. Nevertheless, they exist. They're a starting point, and they are a horizontal cross-cutting structure. So that's really cool. I, John uh, has done stuff here at Chalmers that ver I've seen very few universities uh, really do um, uh, in his tenure as VP for Sustainability, John Holmberg. Students are very active at Chalmers. Uh, I love this uh, English uh, translation, the meeting place for sustainable Chalmerists. That's great, eh? Um, the Challenge Lab. How cool is the Challenge Lab? How many people here know about the Challenge Lab? So a lot of you, yeah. 
really interesting. I visited it last year when it was down at the other, the, the roundhouse, but now it's up here on the main campus. Um, uh, really interesting model. I'm trying to get U of T to adopt something like this in engineering. Um, and then, of course, the living lab. So here we, here's John and here's Johan, and uh, that's today. We, I just took the picture as we walked by. Um, there it is, super monitored, right? Built. This is going to be very cool. Lots of interesting research is going to happen here. So let's put all these five things together. And in a way, Living Lab and Agent of Change are happening already, but maybe could be formalized and, and even deeper. And let's not lose the momentum. There's John in Boston, I think. I getting the Green Gown Award, the most prestigious award for universities uh, originally out of the UK, um, and Chalmers won. And what p aspect of Chalmers won? Uh, the Challenge Lab. That's what won it, so that's why it's on the left there. So there he is, uh, looking uh, jet-lagged but happy, uh, receiving the award uh, uh, just not very long ago, a week and a half ago. So let's not lose this momentum. Chalmers is really well placed to be one of the leading universities in the planet on all this stuff. And what about your Tabor University? There already is linkage. It already is living lab and agent of change. So maybe this could be a pan a university across the city kind of activity. So let's make a difference. Thanks very much. That was a I real tour de force, <laughs> and John is happy to answer a few questions if there are any, even if it's late in the day. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Jürgen Schöber from Chalmers University of Technology. I much appreciate, of course, the last part, but even more so the whole lecture. Thank you very much. It was very useful, and I. I will borrow parts of it, if you allow, uh, in arguments in different situations. But I want to ask you whether in the process of uh, creating um, a sustainable campus in, in uh, UBC, if you have been able to attract um, the corporate sector again in a different way, yeah. and if so, if you managed to do that in a way that you could uh, cultivate the relationship that comes into a way where they are willing to share rather than to, to protect and own. To protect and own. Right. Th this has been a challenge. Uh, I was really optimistic about this in the early days and discovered it's way harder. Um, it's actually easier, we found, to work with uh, the city of Vancouver than the private sector partners because they're so used to this model of philanthropy out that door and then discount pricing on their product uh, through that door. And the idea of strategic partnership where you find that point of intersection where you can do, each can do their own job better because of the partnership is hard to do, especially in Vancouver because there's no head offices in Vancouver. So we kept dealing with the marketing department of Honeywell, say. We spent years working with Honeywell to be a major partner. They were in SIRS, but we couldn't upgrade that to the campus scale um, be, because everyone we knew at Honeywell change jobs in six months. So the general manager for Canada, the chief technology officer at corporate headquarters, and all of the other people we worked with, moved. they just moved on. And so we had to start all over again. So it, it, it's a real challenge to the, the time frames as we've been talking are very, very different. Um, but in principle, I think it can be done, and I think it's actually easier here. When we went to Velux and said, we want to talk to you about Active House, you know, uh, Danfoss, Grunfoss, Rockwell, and Velux have created this really interesting concept of active house, beyond passive house, which is sweeping the world these days. Um, and you look at Velux, they're actually, they do roof windows, but they're not selling roof windows anymore. They're selling air quality and light service. So they're very interested. So I, I actually feel that the Danish industrial structure with all the foundations they create to prevent themselves being bought out by larger companies elsewhere in the world, uh, creates a, a real opportunity for interesting partnership. Um, uh, I think the Swedish situation is different in, in, in that way. But it, it takes a huge, I guess what I'm saying is a huge amount of care and fostering. And it's very much about personal relationships, I find, uh, with the private sector. Um, uh, and so you just have to tend 
and build the relationship slowly over time. It's not going to, uh, at least any time I've been involved, I, I, it doesn't move quickly. Um, but in principle, it should be very productive. If you can manage this time difference problem, uh, and that's where the internships can be much more powerful than students doing uh, research in their thesis, uh, because those are very uh, specified uh, sort of quasi-employment opportunities. Um, and then if you can get the company at a senior enough level to sit down with senior management of the university, not with the individual projects, but actually at the, the planning uh, level and say, how can we work together? I think, well, maybe I'm just being an incurable optimist, but I think <laughs> lots of things can be done. my university, but my question is, do you know, is there a network? I mean, in the same way that universities are, you know, standardized and evaluated and, uh, and ranked, that's the word I was looking for, is there a sort of C40 cities yeah. equivalent for? Yeah, and yeah, there are. I'm, I mean, there's uh, um, USDN um, and there's AISHI. Right? The American Association for Sustained Building Higher Education, and they have awards and annual things. They're more North American, but uh, what is global? The, I've forgotten what the acronym stands for, but it's global. It's much more European and Asian as well as North American. They have annual, the next annual conference is actually at UBC, uh, so you'd be more than welcome, I'm sure, to go there uh, in February. Um, and they do a lot of awards and a lot of peer-to-peer -peer stuff. There's also the EU Environmental Association of Universities and Colleges in the UK who work a lot with the National Union of Students. They're the ones who created the Green Gown Award that you just saw uh, Chalmers win. Uh, but that now, that award has been taken over by a global GUAP, Global University something something. Um, so there are, there absolutely are these groups. They've been dominated by the operational people in the past. But increasingly, the academic side is starting to get involved in that. Um, so uh, it's going, I, I had my first ISDN conference in uh, Hong Kong uh, a year ago, and it was great to go and hear about, you know, everybody else's pain and suffering and, you know, success stories and so on. Uh, so I agree with you. That's really important. You need to feel part of something larger and recognize that other people are going through the same difficulties. But they do, they do exist. Thank you. Thanks. I know people have to leave, so why don't we end there, and if you want to converse further with John, we can do that informally at the front. But could I ask you then to join me in thanking him most sincerely for what has been a very fascinating and stimulating talk of relevance to all of us. Thank you very much.